So this module is so small, we are going to wrap up all four primary tiers in one video. Although they are technically pleomorphs, they have been separated out from the microbes in module 10. Unlike the other pleomorphs that will be discussed, Mycoplasma TACA do not have cell walls, making them unique in medical microbiology. Mycoplasma TACA are made up of the mycoplasmas and ureoplasmas. They are the smallest free-living, self-replicating organisms and are taxonomically separated from other bacteria. They belong to the class molecutes, which I hope is how that's pronounced because I cannot find a phonetic alphabet anywhere for that word. Ureoplasma was once called mycoplasma, but after being mapped, was found to be genetically distinct enough to be categorized as its own genus. In a past module, we have used the generic term atypical pneumonia to describe certain pneumonia states. This type of pneumonia is also commonly referred to as walking pneumonia. Although it is also associated with Legionella and Chlamydia, which we'll cover in the next module, it was originally coined for mycoplasma. This, in part, is due to the lingering yet mild respiratory distress it can cause. It is also due to the fact that these atypical infections were very difficult to treat and often difficult to diagnose. We'll dive into these in a bit. Mycoplasma is one of the leading causes of community-acquired pneumonia. Most cases of M. pneumonia are mild and self-limiting, though it might linger for several weeks. Severe cases can lead to meningitis and hemolytic anemia. For ureoplasma, the name gives away what anatomic area of concern we might have. It is generally a concern for the female urogenital tract. It can lead to urethritis and cervicitis, as well as vaginitis, which may also progress to pelvic inflammatory disease. This can also be seen in uroplasma's cousins, M. genitalium and M. hominis. This makes sense with how closely related these genus are genetically. Unfortunately, a high percentage of the population is reported to be colonized with uroplasma, sometimes making it difficult to know if a positive result needs to be treated. Like Proteus, ureoplasma is a punch mnemonic bug, leading to stone formation in some patients as well. So what would you see from a patient that developed a cough three weeks ago that has lingered? She presents with chest pain, but a cardiac workup is negative. Of course, of the two diseases in this module, this is most likely to be the respiratory infection from mycoplasma. This makes up one of the most common community-acquired pneumonias, with the most common bug being strep pneumonia. You're probably sick of urinary tract infection questions by now, but one more patient comes in complaining of urinary urgency and frequency without a fever. Name the three bacteria in this family that are most likely to cause the UTI. Of the three, Ureoplasma urolytica is probably the most common. It wouldn't hurt to also know the two mycoplasma species associated with urogenital disease, M. hominis and M. genitalium. At least the naming scheme of most of these makes their associated diseases easy to remember. When it comes to testing, this family of microbes has an interesting history. For years, a scientist named Eaton attempted to culture atypical pneumonias thought to be associated with mycoplasma leading to the unknown pathogen being named Eaton's agent. It was also known as PPLO, for pleuronomonia-like organism, since it was not able to be cultured, and many thought it might be a virus or other organism. It was eventually discovered to be a bacteria, as Eaton had thought. Initially, cold agglutination was a method of testing for this, as well as several other pathogens. Though this can still be used today, there are more advanced diagnostic tests. Imaging might also not be that helpful. Chest x-ray is often very nonspecific, and even white blood counts are often not elevated. PCR is becoming the leading way to test mycoplasma and uroplasma, as many culturing results are difficult to attain and can take weeks to grow if successful. I don't think your patient wants to sit in the hospital bed for weeks waiting to know their prognosis. But these tests are expensive, and only some FDA-approved testings currently exist. Diagnosis of the specific microbe is generally only needed in severe cases, so these lab tests are not commonly used in the clinical scenario. Unlike many prokaryotes and eukaryote cells, mycoplasma does not have most of the biochemical pathways used for metabolic needs. This makes it a parasite requiring sustenance from its host. Ureoplasma is urease positive, as discussed above, leading to kidney stone formation. M. pneumonia also has a unique toxin known as CARDS toxin. Though many of these factors are pretty low yield, 
they do add some interesting characteristics to this family that are not seen in other bacteria. Here's a great thought to begin this last year. Which antibiotics covered so far act against the bacterial cell wall? Can you think up a good list? Now, how effective would these be against a bacteria with no cell wall? This is part of the reason that the Mycoplasmataceae family has traditionally been so difficult to get rid of. However, we have come a long way with antibiotics since the 60s. Like our past atypical pneumonia discussions, a macrolide is the first choice. This is mostly given empirically to those with atypical pneumonias. For those with urogenital infections by this family, a macrolide is still probably first choice. Tetracyclines used to be preferred, but now many species are resistant. Azithromycin is a good choice and also covers the potential co-infections with chlamydia. If azithro is not an option on a test question, then clindamycin would be a good alternative choice as well. Now that we are near the end of bacteriology, we're also coming to the end of medical microbiology on this subject. The course with virology, mycology, and parasitology make up the foundation of medical micro. However, medical microbiology, though a required area of study in basic sciences, is not a medical profession. This is an area of confusion for many students, as study materials and occupational responsibilities don't match up well. If you have enjoyed this course and would like to learn more, please rate our YouTube videos and post positive feedback. The more interest shown, the more motivation to quickly create and release new material we will have.